Hello, my name is Rick Rittmaster. I'm an outpatient therapist at Nystrom and Associates in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. But prior to that, uh, I was a Lutheran pastor for 25 years. I've been asked to do a presentation on moral injury, which is a, uh, a particular component of uh, trauma uh, related to PTSD, and that uh, one that affects many of our veterans. Uh, people ask me, how is it that you know you have done work with veterans, uh, and particularly in this regard? And so it's helpful to give a little background, my history. After I graduated from college many years ago, I uh, was a part of uh, the United States Air Force. I was a, a flying guy. I was a navigator on KC-135s and C-130s in the reserves. And it was during that time while I was in the reserves that I went to seminary because I'd felt this calling for many years to become a pastor. And uh, then I was ordained and uh, served two churches, one out in New Jersey and then one in Bloomington, Minnesota. Following that 15 years of parish ministry, I went back into the military as a, an army chaplain and served for 10 years uh, and was in two combat uh, tours there, one in Iraq in 2009 and then in 2014-15 in Kuwait and also Iraq as well. Uh, I then went back to school and got my master's degree in counseling and for the past six years I've been working at Nystrom and Associates in Eden Prairie. So that's my background and let's talk a little bit about <clears throat> a little bit about moral injury. I'm going to pull up the uh, this PowerPoint here. There we go. Moral injury is often referred to as the hidden wound of trauma. It's something that uh, many people who experience PTSD also have this component. Uh, and what it relates to is uh, this particular definition. It's a constellation of psychological symptoms associated with acting in or witnessing events that challenge deeply held moral principles. So it's a, a number of uh, emotional responses that are connected to things that happen to us, traumatic events that happen to us, and challenge our beliefs about who we are and about the world. So my interest in working with veterans began long ago in my first parish. Uh, I had a connection to the veterans just simply because I'd already had uh, um, some history with the military. Several conversations really stood out for me uh, back then. And one in particular was after I was uh, concluding my ministry out in New Jersey, uh, one of my parishioners, an elderly man came to me and he asked if he could talk to me and I said sure so uh, we set up an appointment and he started telling me about his experiences in World War II specifically one terrible night in a foxhole and as he described this story the tears welled up in his eyes he had never told anyone this story before I think he was telling it to me because I was leaving and uh, it felt safe for him to do that. What happened to him was that, I believe it was during the Battle of the Bulge, that he was in a foxhole, he was by himself, young man, scared to death, uh, had his weapon with him. All of a sudden, a German soldier jumped into the foxhole with him and without thinking twice, he shot him. And for the rest of the night, you could hear the man in the throes of death. I sat there in the dark throughout that long night listening to him die. Never told anybody about this before. He carried that secret with him. And 
that is an expression of moral injury. It's the inability to reconcile what I did with the person who I believe I am or should be. So as a young man, he did what he was called to do. And over the years, he became a husband, father, grandfather. And that memory of what he had done, he was unable to reconcile that act with who he understood himself to be. That is a, an example of moral injury. Let me give you another one. This was a, a Vietnam veteran that came to me, and I noticed that in my church that the veterans, some of them seemed to be particularly affected by, um, well, it was the first Gulf War, and then later on the um, invasion of Afghanistan, <clears throat> and then, of course, the invasion of Iraq. And <clears throat> what they experienced was this increased agitation, and I, I think it was a triggering, triggering event for them. Uh, one of my parishioners described what it was like for him in Vietnam when it was around Thanksgiving, and he was helicoptered in with uh, his platoon uh, to protect this hilltop, which he was told had strategic value, and he had to stay there. The helicopters took off. They immediately came under attack, and for four days they fought for their lives and fought for this mission, which they had been uh, put there to complete. So they did that. At the end of the four days, helicopters come back, and they said, we're taking it away. And he said, why? He said, we, we, we've secured this area. And he said, well, it's no longer of strategic value for us. What he experienced was the inability to reconcile a breach of trust that he felt the government of the military uh, had called him to do something and then, in a sense, betrayed him. It's reconciling this breach of trust in institutions, laws, or beliefs about the way things are supposed to be. It wasn't supposed to be that way. Let me give you another example. I saw this happening in Iraq, and it was uh, inexcusable. And the trauma that it caused was uh, unending. A young woman, one of my friends, I joined the army to serve my country while deployed to Iraq. I was raped by a U.S. soldier. It's happened more than one time. It's another example of moral injury. It's the betrayal of relationships. You think somebody has your back and then they betray you. These are all examples of moral injury where our understanding of who we are in relationship to the mission to which we're called, the people that we are supposed to be a team with, somehow that gets betrayed and we haven't end up feeling like we don't know who we are, we don't know who we can trust. So the common themes in moral injury is, first of all, as I say, this sense of betrayal, that things are not the way they are supposed to be. And how I understood uh, laws and, and justice and so forth isn't being manifested in the organizations or, or even within myself. It also is related to a disproportionate in violence. Uh, if you think of the My Lai massacre and the Vietnam War, and there are many other examples of that where the violence was way out of proportion to the objectives that uh, that particular military team was asked to make. <clears throat> Incidents involving civilians saw so this time and again in Iraq and uh, veterans from other wars can talk about this where civilians are in the wrong place at the wrong time 
or that uh, something happens where they are actually um, the targets. When you see that happening, it, it has a tremendous uh, emotional negative impact. And then, of course, the within rank violence, <clears throat> and it happens. Uh, I worked with a chaplain who, back in the first Gulf War, he was in Kuwait, and they were in this large tent. With, there was a lot of soldiers there. And one disgruntled soldier threw two grenades into the tent, killed a number of people. This chaplain ended up getting PTSD, and that within rank violence uh, has, exacerbates the, the trauma because it's, it's a betrayal by somebody within their own team. So you can think of moral injury moving in two different directions. There's the externalizing moral injury where we're looking at the institution or, or we're looking at the system or the organization or the leadership that, that has somehow betrayed us, it's somehow flawed and put us in a compromised situation. That's kind of looking out at something and uh, experiencing the moral injury coming, coming at us from an external experience and then there's the internalized one which is uh, believes that I am flawed I have done something that is beyond my moral code beyond my values and I am beyond redemption so it's it, it could be something from the outside that's sh shaking my world or something from the inside which says I am uh, beyond redemption and the impact is profound in moral injury it can be manifested like PTSD symptoms where uh, someone who experiences it has intrusive thought that they, when they get triggered by certain events or smells or times of the year that they have a tendency to avoid this and then the hallmark uh, desire to numb or to somehow push down those distressing emotions and thoughts. That's similar to PTSD, but it's it's not the same. Negative cognitions and core beliefs. You know this this notion that it was my fault that all this happened, or if I had just done something differently, um, things would not have turned out the way they did. And and so many times these are irrational beliefs, and yet they are they're ordinary. They they just stick and they become difficult for people to see uh, anything beyond that and then there there's a demoralization that goes with it i i was called to do something difficult and i wasn't able to do it uh, and i'm flawed and then another heartbreaking aspect of moral injury are the self-handicapping behaviors uh, like for instance it's really tough for people who have a uh, an intense moral injury to have a healthy intimate relationship with someone else because if they feel flawed or they feel like you can't trust the reality or the environment in which I'm in it becomes difficult then to sustain a, a, a mutual healthy relationship and they end up oftentimes self-sabotaging in a variety of different ways and then there's the self-harm piece, whether it's uh, suicidal ideation or uh, oftentimes veterans who experience this kind of moral injury will resort to uh, self-injurious behavior like cutting or, or burning themselves or doing something that uh, evokes pain and at the same time gives them a sense that uh, this is what I deserve and this is going to actually be more congruent with my beliefs about myself than treating myself with respect. So as I said, the moral, industry, uh, moral in injury is different than PTSD. PTSD is a mental disorder that uh, finally came to be in the context of the Vietnam War when the soldiers come back with this constellation of, of uh, symptoms and it requires a diagnosis. Moral injury, on the other hand, is a, is a dimensional problem. So what I mean by that is that there's a, a spiritual component to it, there's a, a, a values-related component to it, and then it, it, what it does then is 
impacts our our belief in ourself and and our relationship to the world and it um, causes us to question our reality what moral injury does however is it intensifies the effects of PTSD every veteran I've ever talked to that has been diagnosed with PTSD will say that the moral injury component of it is by far the most painful because they can't shake this feeling of shame or the feeling of guilt or the, the sense of betrayal on uh, part of the, their compatriots or the government. And you could treat the symptoms of PTSD, which is the avoidance and the um, exaggerated startle and, and the, the, the desire to uh, kind of shut down and, and just simply isolate the problem with moral injury, as I said, is that, that it, this is something that you carry inside of you. Uh, and the belief itself then becomes a, a limiting factor in your ability to live a life uh, of joy and, and that's worth living. So there's a, a couple different ways of thinking about PTSD versus moral injury. Being the target of killing or injuring in war is often associated with PTSD. So if you're the one that's under attack or you're the one that's injured from something coming at you that's a, a oftentimes an indicator of PTSD being the agent of the killing or failing to prevent death or injuries often associated with the psychological distress and suicide attempts of moral injury so if you're the target it's oftentimes PTSD what you experience if you understand yourself as the agent or somehow you failed to prevent some kind of trauma, that oftentimes is associated more with moral injury. As I said, the moral injury is a dimensional issue. What it does is it shatters our assumptions about our ability to keep ourselves safe about the power that we have to uh, control our environment, assumptions about who I am as an individual, and what the world is, you know, my relationship to the world. What can I depend on? Uh, this, these assumptions are, are challenged in powerful ways. Also, there's a, a spiritual assumptions with my relationship with God could be disrupted. If I understand that God is, is loving and is there to to keep me safe and all of a sudden I get involved in a situation where where my life is in jeopardy and I do something that um, makes the situation worse, it's, it's a, a isolating feeling as though God has disappeared. And beliefs in a, a benevolent God are often challenged have difficulty thinking about God who's supposed to be loving and kind and and forgiving and then I'm confronted with the situation where I cannot forgive myself change my relationship with God so the my whole environment at the physical level because it's affecting me physically the interpersonal level, it's affecting my relationships with, other, with others, and my spiritual level, my relationship with God, often gets redefined and gets more limited, and cynicism creeps in, and the inability to sustain healthy relationships becomes very difficult. So how do you treat this kind of injury? Well, I think it's important to approach it, first of all, as a spiritual issue can't argue somebody out of the belief that they're flawed. can't argue somebody out of the belief that God is judging them if that is their belief. And understanding it as a uh, as something that's that's a transcends psychological issues that there is this kind of transcendent uh, breach, so to speak, between 
the person who experiences the injury and and their own sense of redemption if take that very seriously that is a spiritual issue it's important to understand how guilt and shame function as a coping mechanism this is one of the more insidious aspects of moral injury if you think about somebody who's experienced tremendous trauma and their world is shattered if they can embrace the notion that that somehow they're responsible for it that somehow if they had done something differently they would not be experiencing this distress or the distressing events would not have taken place that belief in itself is a kind of coping mechanism against seeing the world as capricious and chaotic and beyond predictability so in other words if I can feel responsible for things that have happened even though I haven't had any responsibility toward them it's a way to protect myself from the understanding that things just happen stuff happens what we've found is that leveraging the power of group therapy is absolutely uh, critical to healing moral injury because what group therapy does is it creates a, a safe environment where you can put this stuff out on the table and talk about it and then others among the group can also validate what's taken place maybe they've experienced the same and it's in that context of safety where they are able to articulate what they've experienced and receive validation and support from others in a similar situation that's a very uh, powerful experience for them so when you think about the church small group ministries and how the church can also participate in addressing this kind of injury and I'll talk some more about this in terms of a program that I uh, worked on through the VA with building spiritual strengths but the ability to listen without criticism without offering advice just simply listen listening and validating the story of the veterans helps them helps bridge the sense of uh, isolation that they might otherwise experience and in its own way can help them to experience more of a normalized interaction between uh, people because it, they don't have to have the filter on they don't have to put up this front they can just talk about exactly what they experienced and when people listen uh, in a non-critical way uh, that's a powerful aspect of the healing process and then what we discovered especially in a the VA program that I'm going to talk to you about is that the insights of James Fowler's stages of faith development so James Fowler was a developmental uh, psychologist and he applied those concepts to stages of faith where at the earlier stages of faith you know we're more concrete you know if you're a little kid you think about the Easter Bunny you wake up and there's an Easter basket there and you ask your parents what's going on and it was you know it's the Easter Bunny left this and you believe it and right and wrong are pretty clear and there's no gray areas moving from that kind of concrete thinking to more abstract symbolic thinking where there are ambiguities there are gray areas there are uh, things aren't always so black and white and that our understanding of God may be more nuanced than at earlier stages of faith really important and you can move through these stages of faith in the context of a supportive group it's moving from one-sided thinking I'm either good or I'm bad to acceptance of ambiguity I have both good and bad within me and I think Lutherans in particular have uh, a real theological, important theological insight to add to this when you 
think about the law gospel dialectic uh, or you know as, as Martin Luther talked about we're both sinners and saints in the same um, same being we have a, an ability to embrace ambiguity as a part of uh, our own spiritual journey and that can be very helpful for veterans who are are looking to breach that gap between their sense of failure or <clears throat> uh, unredeemable self with God's unconditional love. So what James Fowler says is that it's possible for our moral reasoning capabilities to change during our development. As a little kid, we may understand that to lie is wrong. You should never lie to someone else. As we move through that moral reasoning development, we may understand that there may be times when it's really important not to tell the whole truth, especially for the welfare of the person maybe that uh, we're talking to. Also, what is understood as right in one stage can become understood as wrong in another. Uh, what that means is that it may be uh, right for me at one stage to judge somebody for something that they do and at a later stage when I can understand more of the nuances of their experience, see another point of view that uh, that same kind of black and white judgment might not be effective or could be quote unquote wrong or inaccurate. Here's another important stage of development insight that there's this tendency toward self-criticism of earlier stage actions from the vantage point of a later stage. We do this all the time. You know, we look back and maybe when I was uh, in high school or adolescent, why did I do what I did? If I just had made this choice or made that choice, I wouldn't be experiencing the difficulties that I am now. That looking back through the eyes of a person that has more experience, you know, a more clear understanding about the implications of decisions that they, they make. Uh, and if we judge that earlier self through that later perspective, it's an unfair judgment. Because when we're in the context of the situation that confronts us, all we've got is what we've got in the particular moment. We do the best we can with what we have to work with. It's in looking back on that from a, a wiser point of view that we can see maybe the difficulties or the challenges or the ineffectiveness of a decision that we make. But to criticize that earlier self is uh it just exacerbates the moral injury because it's it's an unfair judgment here's another piece that is was challenging for me as a pastor is that if a veteran or anybody else for that matter who confesses sins that aren't really a sin or confesses something that they did a wrong that wasn't really wrong given the situation that they were confronted with actually reinforces irrational guilt. So, for instance, if I talk to the Vietnam veteran who said he was up there for four days fighting with his life, helicopter swooped him out, said this isn't important anymore. And he assumes the belief that he did something wrong because he followed through on an order that he thought was what he was being asked to do, which he was, and then the military changed their mind on it. If I'm 
going to try and help absolve him of the guilt of having done something wrong, all I'm doing is reinforcing this irrational guilt. And so we want to be real careful about that. That when we're absolving sins, that we're clear about exactly what sin it is that needs absolution. The connection between spirituality and healing is very important for addressing moral injury. Spiritual involvement helps survivors make meaning of life events. You think of the work of Viktor Frankl in World War II. He was a psychiatrist who studied under Freud, and he developed this protocol called logotherapy which he understood meaning that if you can help uh, a patient to make some kind of meaning out of the challenging experiences that they're in, that there's a, an ability for them to transcend the hopelessness of their situation. And he did that during the, the course of the Holocaust. He was Jewish and was in the Holocaust and did a lot of his research during then. And he wrote a very profound book called Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl. The ability to make meaning out of life events is huge. And that's a spiritual exercise. Also, prayer correlates with lower levels of anxiety and symptoms. Our clients who are able to access a prayer life are able to reduce some of those anxieties and the moral injury symptoms. And prayer is also associated with higher levels of post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth is an important concept because oftentimes when we think about somebody who has PTSD or struggles with moral injury, we see them as a victim. Post-traumatic growth, on the other hand, is the ability to move through that difficult constellation of symptoms and come out on the other side in a at a healthier place and where they experience fear and anxiety that then gets transformed in, into sadness and then ultimately into wisdom as post-traumatic growth where they regain a sense of their self not as they were but maybe more nuanced more uh, uh, more accurate in terms of them being a whole person that have that has both light and dark in them Positive adjustments associated with uh, perceiving a higher power as benevolent and just. When we think of God as being loving and kind and involved in our lives, that has a positive impact in terms of getting better. Experiencing God as being supportive and then involving ourselves in religious rituals. These are all um, elements that really help people on the road to recovery from PTSD as well as moral injury. On the other hand, people who use religion to facilitate avoidance uh, find that their ability to adjust goes down. That they're not able to regain a, a sense of self. Uh, when I talk about using religion to facilitate avoidance, what I'm talking about is kind of taking this black and white picture about their faith they're either things are good or they're bad uh, or that when I experience distressing thoughts I'm just simply going to give it all to God and not deal with it myself ultimately that doesn't work if they feel alienated from God if they have a theology that says that I am beyond redemption that has a negative impact on their ability to get better. If they experience religious conflicts with others, whether that comes in the form of judgments from others or misunderstanding or all the other ways in which we can invalidate one another, that has a negative impact on their adjustment. If, they, uh, if their fears and their guilt are exacerbated by their theological understanding, that has an impact, a negative impact on their adjustment. 
All right, so I alluded to a program that I was a part of. This was back in 2016, and I worked with Dr. Irene Harris at the VA. She's a very gifted psychologist who had a passion for working with veterans, and she put together this study that um, was intended to help veterans access their spiritual strengths in helping them to overcome PTSD and moral injury. And the objectives of this protocol was to help them build uh, on their perception of God as being loving and supportive, uh, to help the veterans resolve fears that God is punishing or abandoning them, that their distress is somehow related to God's punishment of them to help them learn how to resolve guilt over actions that they have made or their failure to act in ways they believe that they should have. And then to work with God to resolve this anger and guilt, moving toward forgiveness, so that in a sense they become a partner with God as opposed to, to being you know without any kind of... Um, any kind of power of their own to participate in God's redemption. And then also to work with God to find strategies for coping with distress, because that's an ongoing part of PTSD as well as moral injury. So what we did was put together groups uh, based on this format. There were eight two-hour sessions of small groups from five to ten in a group. And we facilitated a rapport by sharing military and religious histories. Group members were able to talk about their military experience as well as their religious experience. We had uh, exercises that involved prayer, meditation at every one of these sessions. And then we had an extensive discussion on what we call theodicy. theodicy. And that is a uh, the, the issue of, of trying to resolve God as being benevolent and our human suffering. Well, you know, where is God in human suffering? So that's that's the theodicy perspective. And then helping them to embrace active coping styles versus avoidant ones. One of the hallmarks of PTSD symptoms is this tendency to avoid either places that cause the trauma or uh, anything that would remind them of that. And the result is that their, their world becomes very constricted, very small and very isolated. And so an active coping style would be kind of leaning into it and, and developing ways that are going to keep them connected to the world and to themselves. It also involved discussion of forgiveness and facilitating conflict resolution, how to, how to do that. These are all part of the methodology of this protocol that Dr. Harris had developed. And so she took meticulous notes on this. Uh, it was um, evidence-based criteria. The average age of the participants was 61. And you can see the range of ethnic and religious groups Half of them were to participate in what is called present-centered group therapy, which is a non-spiritually based type of therapy intended to help the participants stay in the present as opposed to being in the past and to problem-solve their situations. And then the other half uh, participate in this building spiritual strength protocol, which I just discussed. There were no significant differences in PTSD symptoms across the groups at the baseline. They were all starting at the same place in terms of their symptomology. So the idea was to determine if the building spiritual strengths protocol could be as effective as other treatments for PTSD, like that present-centered group therapy. And also to assess the effects of building spiritual strengths protocol on moral injury, you know, was, was going to be effective with that help. And so she 
Look for chaplains, whether they're military, hospital chaplains with mental health training as therapists. And that's how I ended up working with uh, Dr. Harris. Results were that building spiritual strengths was as effective as the present-centered group therapy. So in other words, building spiritual strengths was able to reduce the PTS symptoms uh, as effectively as the non-spiritually based therapy. Here's what's really interesting though. The building spiritual strengths was more effective than the present-centered therapy in reducing the moral distress. It was also more effective in reducing uh, what she describes as the retribution theodicy. In other words, that when I experience distress, that somehow this is a punishment from God. That notion was reduced through the Building Spiritual Strengths Protocol. And then there was this observation as well, that the veterans at a higher level of psycho-spiritual development, those veterans who were able to tolerate some ambiguity and see things not as black and white but more shades of gray, appeared better able to resolve their moral and spiritual distress. And as you'll recall, part of the part of that protocol was to help move them along from a, a concrete, literal, black and white faith perspective to this more nuanced uh, shades of gray and able to tolerate uh, things that are in opposition to one another, like the law and the gospel, both of those things, or that we are both sinner and saints, both of us. Uh, both of those elements are part of who we are. So the building spiritual strengths uh, appears to be as effective for PTSD treatment, but substantially more effective in treating moral injury. And at the time, this was the only clinical trial of a treatment for moral injury that documents a reduction of moral distress. So uh, she has continued to do work on this. I don't have all the information on that. It continues to bear out, however, that accessing a person's spiritual strengths, focusing on their understanding of who God is, giving them the skills to to be able to talk about their moral injury in an in a safe and supportive environment reduces intensity of those symptoms related to moral injury. So here's a case study. <clears throat> Pat was a 78 year old Caucasian male. Uh, he came out of the Methodist Church and he self referred to this particular study building spiritual strengths. He was medically fragile. He had leg had been amputated. He had COPD, congestive heart failure, diabetes. He was in a tough place medically. He'd been in Vietnam, experienced combat trauma. And interestingly, he'd also reported a history of child abuse, which this is anecdotal from my work with veterans. I would say a lot more experienced childhood trauma who then later on went to develop PTSD and moral injury than those who had not experienced that trauma as kids. So childhood abuse is a vulnerability factor in the eventual development of PTSD and moral injury. The beginning of the study, Pat had high levels of PTSD symptoms, a lot of suicidal thoughts, although he was able to promised that he could keep himself safe, he had high levels of inappropriate guilt, taking responsibility for things over which he had no responsibility, and the only social contact he had was his dog. No contact at all with his family. He was at a, a, a level two psycho-spiritual development. He understood himself as God in black and white, that he, God was up there, and he was being judged and really beyond redemption saw himself as unforgivable, and he, all his distress was perceived as punishment from God. And he was one of these people that used self-blame to maintain an illusion of control. Again, if I can take responsibility for things that I'm not responsible for, then somehow that protects me from the chaos of not being able to predict what's going to happen in my world. 
We used a number of different interventions. There was the empty chair exercise where the veterans were able to talk uh, talk to God or talk to maybe their enemy. If they were able to uh, articulate thoughts and feelings and beliefs that uh, that were focused on someone who was no longer there. Group members saw one another as easily forgivable. That was just always interesting to see how that played out, where a veteran could say, you know, everything you're describing is something that, that I would never judge you for. And that had a, a healing effect in and of itself. Their ability to understand uh, and integrate the concept that God can be loving and there can be pain and distress in this world. They also worked independently and in group on, on, on protocols for self-forgiveness through a workbook that Dr. Harris had provided. So Pat did all this. By the end of the intervention, by the end of the eight weeks, he experienced complete remission of the symptoms at a follow-up evaluation. So this is several weeks after concluding his uh, eight weeks of building spiritual strengths protocol. He was able to reconnect with the community of faith, maintain connections with other group participants. His social world consisted of a lot more people than just his dog. So here's the, the point. <clears throat> people experience trauma. Perhaps we all experience trauma at some point in our lives. And when we experience trauma, we're susceptible to the post-traumatic.